Thanks for taking the time to download this BBC Radio 5 Live podcast. To search for other podcasts you might like, click bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live, where you'll also find our terms of use. Fast Freddie Spencer, considered one of the greatest motorcycling racers of all time. A three-time world championship winner, he was a teenage prodigy and raced against adults when he was only 11 and could barely touch the handlebars. He won his first world title aged 21. He's now written an autobiography called Feel My Story. Thank you very much for being with us, Freddie. Oh, well, thank you. It is really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. Tell us about your love of bikes at a young age growing up in Louisiana. Well, being and growing up in Louisiana, it was not really a place that you consider a motorcycle hotbed. It was there was a lot of sports, uh, American based sports, you know, American football, baseball, um, a lot of fishing. But my brother and my dad, um, when I came along in 1961, they were just getting into motorcycles, and so I was exposed to it in that respect. And I started riding a, a little mini bike when I was about three years old, and it was um, it was amazing. I had a nice piece of property. We had two acres of land, and and um, it was it was just something that I was I was drawn to and, and born to do. What was the feeling? The feeling that you got your earliest memory of that sense of something very special when you're riding the bike. Oh well, it was it was how I felt inside and it was something that as when I was a little when I was about 4 or 5 years old and if I would struggle riding the bike that day um, and I talk about it in feel because I was dealing with my hand I fell in a leaf fire when I was uh, almost 3 years old. And so it was it was that connection with the motorcycle and when I would lay in bed at night I would think about ways that I could improve my riding then I would go out the next day and I would do it. And it gave me this incredible sense of trust in my own ability to do things. And and I, I tell the story about how that I could determine if it was wet on the ground by the, the coloration of the leaves. If they were darker colored, be wet under the ground, under the leaves, or if it was a, a lighter color. And it was something that taught me how to be aware. And again, to trust that judgment, how everything happens in front of you. And everything I do here affects what happens out there. And it was those little glimpses into that that gave me such this incredible ability to pay attention to things. And that's one reason why I started so young. I talk about in the book about seeing the photo of Miss Tronda when I was six. And then, you know, I walk in his house at 21. Mm -hmm. And and it was that, that trust. And I believe that it is in many ways that simple, but so powerful. And again, it's about awareness and what you pay attention to. And living 100% in that moment. Oh, absolutely. And because I, I started riding so young in my yard at four years old, all the way up to I was 15, four hours a day. And I would do it a minimum of five days a week. And then we'd race on weekends. And, and I look back now, it was a perfect form of meditation. Yeah. Uh, what was your, uh, <laughs> Freddie, what was your parents' uh, attitude to health and safety? Well, my my dad, of course, I always say he was the real racer of the family. Um, but my mom was the real strength, and and so the combination of the two. For example, health and safety. I couldn't ride in my yard without a helmet, and I tell the story in the book about the one time I did is the one day she drove up into the yard, and caught me. <laughs> so I knew I couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> and very bad time. Exactly. In yours. But you know, they always taught me that. Same thing with school. It was extremely important. Um, that I that I did well and kept my focus doing other things and and that balance was so important because it they gave me the freedom to be able to do exactly what I knew I, I should do and what I believed in my dad always would say I build the bikes in Freddie races them and but they gave me the support and independence to be able to trust and believe in, in that but at the same time the other things that are important too which is going out I did other sports I lettered in, in American football and basketball in high school so I had a nice balance I, I did well in school in fact when I in 1979 one even though I was already a national champion you know I always you know thought about if this didn't work then I could do this and, and, and I guess how much uh, we use this word these days haters but you know to be so young and so talented must have incurred quite a lot of envy, resentment mm. from some of the older guys. How did you deal with that? Well, because I, I did start racing 
quite a bit younger than most, even the other kids out there. When I, that first race I was in, I was four, and everybody else was about seven or eight years old. <laughs> and so they would they would oh. do little things like if there was an older kid in Longview, Texas, and he would say, if you beat me today, I'm going to kick your butt, you know, before we get back. And I would go out and win, and then I would hurry and go back to the truck, you know. But I was so shy when I was when I was young, I, in in so many ways. Um, One of the reasons was because you'd hurt your hand so badly in that fire mm, when you were three. Tell yes. us about what happened when you were three and who saved you. Well, um, my sister and my we grew up outside of the city limits in Shreveport, and so they would we had leaves. We had about two hundred trees in in the in the property, and and I always say that's what taught me to be precise riding through the trees. But when the leaves would fall in in the fall part of the winter and and uh, or, or the seasons, and they would rake up the leaves because there were so many you couldn't really carry them away. It was it was allowed to be able to pile them up and, and within a controlled area and burn the leaves. And so one day, uh, my sister um, and my mother were out there. I was I was only about three, and they they told me this story, of course. And my mom was walking toward the leaves, and I decided to go follow her. And, and, and we had a helper, Levy C., who worked in the yard for years. And and um, he was a friend of the family's and supported by the family. And so he decided to f- – he saw me take off, and he just took off after me. And, and as it turned out, I tripped on a on a stump and as I was going over, and I fell in with my left hand, my left hand and arm. And, and he saved, right before I completely fell in, he saved me by the back of my shirt and pulled me out. But the temperature, because they had been setting and on fire for about 24 hours, was really hot. And by the time he pulled me out, it had already burned all the skin off my left hand and had seven operations and, and many problems. My parents were told he would lose his hand before he was maybe, th- before I was three or four years old. And and uh, it was really difficult, and, and I vaguely remember, and I remember the pain every day, and it was one of the things that I talk about when I ride on my, my motorcycle is, is it kind of gave me relief from that. And, um, but it, was, it developed a relationship uh, with Levy C., who I talk in the story, and it, it taught me at such an early age. We, I would sit out with him, and, and we would eat sandwiches together, and, and he was just this incredible. That's how I saw him, and it, it taught me a lot at such an early age. Yeah, he's an African-American yes, man. Yes, he was, And you yes. talk about how when you used to go, because you say it's like part of the family, when you used Absolutely. to go on road trips together, right. you used to have to find specific... Yeah. Uh, yeah, garages so it, to stop in. Why in, was that? In the southern part of the United States at that time, you know, with the segregation, it was it was we would travel well from our house or back to Blanchard where where Levy C lived, and and I would go along, and and if we had to stop or use the restroom, then he couldn't go inside like everyone else, and I I, I could never understand that. You know, Levy C taught me the most important phrase I learned as a young man was you know, "Little Fred, everything happens for a reason," and just believe and. And I never forgot that, and and that was what what I saw in him, and I took that from that beginning time, and and um, and I share that. Um, people who haven't read the book, but people who know around your story, would think about your child childhood as being well, you know, blissful, mm. completely and utterly Absolutely. blissful. But there is a, a dark part of your childhood that you talk about in the book. Um, have you ever spoken about being sexually abused no, as a boy? No, I ne- never before? have. No, never have before. And, and it, it's an uh, entire life. And I wasn't even sure if I ever would talk about it someday. But it was interesting when I, as I talk about in the book, this one place I went began on August 2nd, 2010. And it was the beginning of the journey where I began to truly understand why I experienced these things. And, and it was the that, that week that I actually began writing. And one of the things that, that came from that and the interaction with the Teresa and Miss Adas and different different people along the way and begin to tell the story was was that aspect and dealing with that because it's something as a child that you feel so ashamed about and especially when it's people that that you respect or or that you are responsible for you and it was just neighbors and and older older boy and girl and what I was exposed to and I never shared that even with my my family and I think again I was very shy and you and you feel innately ashamed and I, I thought about how would I share that because it's not it's not the just uh, the drama about wanting to share but why and and this is it is for me is that something like that happened when I was a child even being burnt but look at the the things and opportunities that I got and and you have hope and belief and trust and it was actually through that trust with others that I I knew that I could share this part of that story and that is why this book to me 
is about, yes, I tell that story, but it's a privilege to be able to share all those moments with others and tell their part in the story. I mean, at such a young age, that must have very much affected your ability to be able to trust others. Absolutely, and in, in one degree. And that's where motorcycling was such a gift for me. Uh, certainly the ability to be able to ride and the opportunity to be able to express myself through through my riding. and But it, it certainly uh, can affect and does affect um, you sharing that intimate part because it is a very intimate part of what we experience. And it's why, you know, I, I view it even more than that. It's why as a child the most important thing that we can do is protect that young spirit because it is about trust and belief that gives them the opportunity as they grow older to be able to see those glimpses and be able to see those moments with others that I've been able to do. And, and motorcycling opened that up for me. And so to be able to share and, and tell someone that has gone through that, that it, it doesn't have to define you just like it didn't define me, but that trust and opportunities can come that, um, that wouldn't if you let it. You're listening to Fast Freddie Spencer, one of the greatest motorcycling racers of all time, a three-time world championship winner. He's with us here on Five Live on Often in addition to talk about his book, Feel, My Story. And just reading that passage in your book about that time when you were five or six years old and you said that you never knew if you would ever tell anybody about it. But I guess when you came to starting to write the book, you knew that it had to come in it. But to talk about it on radio for the first time... <laughs> of course. Uh, well done, you. But, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's quite tricky for you. How does that feel for you to, to address your demons, speak it out to other people? Well, you know, that that's where it becomes... It's it's not... It's more than just about me or, or mm -hmm. perception. And and that's, that's the part that... Um, sure, this is this is extremely difficult in that respect. But I know that it's something I should do, and and it's it's more important that it might help others. And I I feel so privileged to be able to get to do what I've done in my life, and the experiences and the people I've got to do it with. Um, you know, and and that is life. You know, that's the thing about every. This is a story, and. Um, even in the case in, in mine that everything has gone so well and the opportunities I've had, there's, there's other parts of it. Um, and, and that's what gives it purpose, you know. Before, because you are definitely a man on a journey at all times, I, mm. I, I'm feeling. Mm. And there, there was that epiphany right at the height of your career where you realised that it was actually not really truly satisfying your soul. We'll talk about that, but we want to talk about all the racing success before we get to that. Sure. Um, Ian from Darlington just says, lots of texts coming in for you, Freddie. Fantastic to hear Fast Freddie today. I had the pleasure to meet him and his partner last year when they took part in a charity motorcycle ride around a cold, wet Northumberland. Ooh, a <laughs> most genuine, humble man and one of the greatest ever racers. And somebody on Twitter, Stuart Thompson, says, much. Amazing. I remember watching Freddie when we still had the Transatlantic Trophy meetings at Easter. And somebody asked, Hi, Fast Freddie, total legend. Love watching in GPs. But does he remember Transatlantic Trophy matches, teams of Americans versus Britain, Europeans? Fantastic weekends. A lot of people mentioning those Transatlantic weekends. Whatever happened to them? Well, you know, they were great. They were like our Ryder Cup, you know. And, and I like golf too, actually, you know. Uh... And so being a part of a team, because, you know, in racing, certainly you have your team of, of your crew and things, but you're, you're not part of a, of a motorcycle team as such. And so the opportunity for me came in, in Easter of 1980. Uh, I'd won my very first, or I was leading my very first international race at, at 18 years old, which was the Daytona 200. Wow. And unfortunately, the bike broke while in the lead, and, and I didn't win. But after the race, I was approached by, a gentleman, Bruce Cox and Gavin Tripp, and, and those two were organizing the match races over here. They had one rider who dropped out, and they added me as the last person on the team. And so I came over here, and, and one of the great, great stories for me, or moments for me, was on Thursday. I, we show up at Brands Hatch in Range Rovers, and we had these really cool jackets. And I get out of the car, and all the fans start running toward the car, and behind me was Barry Sheen and Kenny Robertson. I realized after a few moments they were just running through me to get to those guys, and, <laughs> and you know because they didn't know who I was. But I, it was it was such a great experience. Went out, we did like forty five minutes, and and everybody told me how difficult Brands Hatch was, but I love challenges, obviously like that. And and the next day I went out and won both races, and um, I beat Kenny and Barry in both races, and that day changed my life from the standpoint of 
on Thursday, I was a good national racer. Nobody really knew who I could do outside the United States. And then in one day, and, and it gave me this incredible opportunity. And, and I remember when I was walking under the tunnel, my teammate, Dale Singleton, who was part of the team, he asked me, were you nervous? And I said, well, I, j I can't wait. And I realized, you know, this is where, where I want to be. And that, that mindset makes such a huge difference, you know. And, um, and so I went out and and it was such a great, great chance. But I do miss that. I raced, We raced in a couple of more, but they really haven't been um, that popular in twenty over 20 years. Um, you just mentioned how much you love golf. I can't think of two more extreme differences in the sport uh, <laughs> yeah. from what you've done in sport to golf. So how do you replicate the adrenaline rush? Because it's like a, a rock star coming off stage yes, but doing you, a race. Well, but for me, for me, riding a motorcycle has always been this very um, personal thing as far as it was about the movement. It was about the precision. It was it was the other things, and that's why I talk about the other things in the story, that that connection and something that gave me inside this ability, to this chance to ex express and, and to, to share what I could do. And so when I when I when I ride a motorcycle, it's it's that aspect. And believe it or not, in golf, it's it's also very methodical. I I always say riding a motorcycle is, is this very practical, technical thing, and that's yeah. why technique is so important. But it's about everything you see, sense, and feel, and it's about trusting that and anticipating. And, and when you combine those two together, it's it's amazing. Your parents didn't push you, did they, Not towards anything? You were allowed a bit of a free reign, really, to decide what you wanted to do. But when they did realise how passionate you were about motorcycle racing, they, they did support that 100%. Whose idea was it that you drive, you and your dad, in his car through the night when you were just 30 <laughs> years of age? Yeah. Well, it was my idea. It was the same one that 11 years old when I said, Dad, I want a road race. And there's a there's a race the next day. Ask, he goes, we don't have a bike. I go, ask TC, Mr. Carter, he'll give us one, you know. <laughs> and so, but it was that same thing. And, and again, my dad, yeah, we were going away to Daytona. We were late. And um, and we, the only way we could get there is we had to drive through the night. And I said, I can do it. And so he let me, he he let me drive. Let you. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Oh, no. so, Almost the definition of a liberal parent. I yeah, think, exactly, in that respect, yeah, exactly. So yeah. at 11, when you won, or when you did that first big, big race, and you were so, without a bike initially, but you were so sure of yourself even then. Yes, I again it's it's one of those um beliefs, you know, I I know that riding a motorcycle from the my earliest time was something that I could do. And and again, I I think it's a combination of that. It was certainly my mindset, but it was also the opportunity again, the support as you mentioned about my parents and and they didn't push me, they supported me. And there's a big difference with that and and that clarity um, along with my own conviction um, and belief in what I could do together was, was what made it possible. You're fearless, I would say, but you're, you're risk-averse, it's fair to say. Absolutely. You know, most people assume, uh, and it's understandable, you know, that you're a risk-taker and, and the fact of taking chances, but the reality is I'm not at all. I, I don't like risk in, in that respect, but I do believe... It, it, if, you, if you look at... All the opportunities um, that, that came along, each one of them required a couple of things. If, as I talk about in the story, you know, the belief watching the broadcast in 79 when I saw Ms. Trump hung up on screen, you know, I, I related that to that picture when I saw that when I was six. There was no rational decision, uh, reason to do it, but I believed it's what I should do. Riding a motorcycle is something, you know, I practiced in my yard and something that I perfected in home, but it was hours and hours and hours and hours to, to do that. I never assumed I could do it. I believed and trusted that I could get good at it. And so, you know, that belief in, in making the right decision along with, with what I could do on a motorcycle together um, allowed me to be able to do things that you might consider even outside my comfort zone. You know, I think uh, that, you know, that is one part that I... I, I talk about, you know, we, we want things to happen in our life every day. We want opportunities to happen, but are you willing to be able to step out that door to do it? And and so that's why I talk about not just the traumas, but also the fears and things that I experienced growing up, because you, you look at my riding, it's so certain, and but it took a lot of effort to get to there, but also took a lot of trust. Mm. Once you're aware, of course, that something that you're doing is that dangerous, it has to become a supremely technical 
think because sure. the tiniest thing that can go wrong, this idea that somehow you're all kind of adrenaline junkies and speed exactly. freaks, etc., is 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 is, is wrong. It's not the case at all. Not not the case at all. And in fact, you know, it's it's uh, it's certainly a skill. It's a belief, and and then it's a trusting to be able to do it. And and the thing is, is that you almost have to take the emotion out of that aspect of it. Um, it it'd be very clear. You know, it's it's when somebody asks me, "What do you think about when you're sitting on the Stark Line?" and you don't because your preparation is the clarity then of, of kind of trusting your ability to be able to do it. It is right. dangerous, though, and no, sure. nobody can deny that. Of and, I, and I know that a lot of other things and professions and sports are dangerous too, but road racing has got to be right up there at the top of them. So have, how do you balance that with, you know, how your mum and dad, how your loved ones have felt, would have felt oh, over sure. the years when you get injured? Well, that that is the most difficult thing, not not for us, but the people certainly who care for us. And it's something that I've, I was always aware of and, and always, um, you know, was conscious of. And, and that's the difficult thing, you know, and that's where my mom, you know, the strength it takes or it took her to be able to, uh, to support and, and to trust. You know, I, I tell the story when I was, you know, four or five years old, we were walking around the, the hotel and I used to get stomach cramps really bad after the races on Friday nights. And it was because I get so keyed up and then relax. And so my mom asked me one time, she, we were walking, it's about one o'clock in the morning. She's holding my hand, walking along. And she said, why do you want to keep doing this? And I says, because this is what I, I know I should do. And, and so imagine the difficulty or how difficult that was for her, but the support that she gave me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but it is, it's hardcore and I can never get away with it. I'm from Northern Ireland and, you know, it's a big, big road racing and, and motorbike place and the Dunlops, obviously, sure. you'll know, come from there. And I've had the privilege of, of watching some of them race and going to the Northwest 200. But I always do wonder when people say, oh, you know, he died doing what he loved. Mm. Mm, sure. is, is that enough I always think to myself of a of a thing for a, a mother with two children to, sure, to, to sure. live with do yeah. you know what I mean sure but at the same time at the same time you know we get one opportunity at this and 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 if we believe it's something for example since I was a kid you know it's, it's, I knew this was exactly what I was supposed to do mm -hmm. and so you take that certainly into consideration and for me riding a motorcycle is uh, just as easy as walking across a room. So, you know, that is one of the aspects that that if you if you understand what you're mm -hmm. doing is a is a big element uh, that makes a difference. And, you know, it's it's again part of and I talk about in the book, you know, part of what what is your purpose, you know? Um you know, you were into you you were in your late thirties by by the time yes. your father passed away. Yes. Um, but of course, he was such an integral part of everything, wasn't it? Oh yeah, my my dad, my dad. When I when I came along, um, my sister was fourteen and my brother was eleven years old, and so they were getting. You know, it was just a few years, and they they were leaving the house, and and so it was my my dad and my mom and I, and and my dad was racer on a local level and so he he didn't have any experience running at a national level and certainly would never have any understanding of it at the world championship level and that's you know when i tell the story 11 when i saw that picture of ken anderson that really was the the moment where it inspired me i knew i was going to do that someday which is kind of what expired inspired me a few weeks later to ask about when i heard over the loudspeaker about getting a bike but my dad, who never really had any experience at that level, and this is one thing I respect so much and appreciate so much now, um, uh, is the fact that he, even though he didn't, he trusted what I believed I should do. And that takes a lot of faith and, and trust in me. And, and so I, I had two parents who gave that and instilled that in me, and, and I can't emphasize enough how, how important that was. And then as... It got to the point uh, in my in the mid seventies after I had um, eleven years of of him working on the bikes. We we met the guy by happenstance, pitted next to him, Irv Kanemoto, who would who would take me to that next step in my career and on to the world championship. We win world titles together, and and imagine how unselfish that was. Uh, to my dad, who had always been just me and him, and he told Irv, he said, "I I've taken Fred as far as I can." And, but I believe that he can do, uh, goes uh, to that next level or beyond. And so um, 
Could you help him? And, and, and that's how I got to that next point. Fast Freddie Spencer. Stay with us, please, Freddie. We've got a lot more to uh, talk to you about. 85058 is the call, a text number. I know there's a number of you texting to say how much you love Fast Freddie Spencer, but if you have any questions for Freddie, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer them. Fast Freddie Spencer is our guest for the next little while here on Afternoon Edition on Five Live. The texts are flooding in. Alan in Edinburgh says, still the simplest and coolest helmet design. I own a replica and it's just so classy and I ride a Honda. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ian says, could you ask Freddie just how hard it was racing a 500 two-stroke on the edge with such a peaky engine which could throw you off at any moment? Love it, that. Tech, technical yeah, questions. Technical speak yeah. there. Yeah, uh, just that. a couple more. Avril in <laughs> Edinburgh as well says, as well as being an absolute legend, Freddie is a real gentleman. Had the pleasure of meeting him some years ago in an event in Stafford. Awesome. And finally, Paul in Irving says, just pulled over to send this. Hello to, to Freddie. I wanted to thank you for your skill and the manner in which you were and are one of the true greats. I saw you at several GPs in the 80s and bought the T-shirt and the helmet, literally. You, Randy and Eddie, led the way for the USA in my 20s and I thank you for that. I didn't know we had so many motorcycle racing fans that listen to this program. Oh, they're yeah. great fans. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, there's a sports fans too. Yeah, know. they yeah. absolutely are. And look, well, we're a pretty great well, sports Well, I do appreciate that. Yeah. Station, if we can say it ourselves. Of course. So, listen, just tell yes. us a little bit about the big change in your life at the very, very top of your career. What happened? Yes, it was, uh, I, I start the book off where at the, at the pinnacle, if you think about, um, I had... At that point, uh, I was 23 years old, and I decided to do the two world championships in one year, um, which had only been tried a few times in the modern era. Uh, Kenny Roberts in 1978, and then before that, Jarno Saarinen, before he was killed uh, in a tragic accident, but in 73. And so I had the support of HRC, uh, Honda, uh, and assembled really the greatest team of crew and mechanics. And so the all in the beginning part of the year, we struggled a little bit with the 500. I was leading the 250 part of the world championship, which today would be the Moto2 class. Mm -hmm. The Moto GP would be the 500. And I had just gotten um, the lead in or, or in the point standings. And it was the Italian Grand Prix at that time. It was called the Nations Grand Prix at Mugello in May. And I went out and won the 500 race first and then um, at the 250 race after, and it was really a hot day. Everything came together, and it was the greatest moment uh, because not only I was already world champion, you know, in, from 83, but this was something that was really the biggest challenge of my life was to win, try to win the two world titles in one year. I'm sitting in my motorhome after the race, the 500 race, and and as I say in the book, I, I was sitting there looking at the trophies across the table, and I was sitting on the bed, still on my leather zone, and I, I, I was looking at it, and the sense came over me that this was not all, all that it, I was supposed to know. And, and that's the best way I know to describe it. It was not a feeling of after the fact, you know, of like a little let down after achieving this. It wasn't that at all. In fact, I couldn't have been more appreciative and thankful and more enjoyment that. It was just that little sense, a glimpse of something. And but it wasn't the first time. And as I talk about in the book, it actually in December of '84, and then later on after I won the world championship, uh, the both titles in that fall. And and I and I talk about them in 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 the book because of many reasons. As I believe it happens that way, and if you believe it can happen, and that we have those moments that that are in the most intimate times. And and that's why I share that. And, and it was, again, not an anticlimactic feeling at the end of winning that day at Magello because that was the last thing I felt. It was just this little window of, that there was something more. Have you found what you were looking for? Well, that, that's, that's what this book is about. Um, I talk about that. That's why I talk about that four months beginning of August 2nd when you were least expecting. I just had my backpack and... And I trained kind of or went through these little glimpses my whole life. And I believe many people do. I've, I talk about, you know, in those stories that you read in the book that seem so very basic, simple, they're not that at all. In fact, they're powerful moments. And is recognizing those is what allows you to get the most out of them and sharing it with others. I believe true enlightenment comes from that, that what we share together. It's so good to talk to you. We've really, really, really enjoyed having you on the programme, Freddie. Wish well, we had a bit longer. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to it and thank you.
Ask Freddie Spencer, one of the greatest motorcycling racers of all time, and the book is called Feel My Story. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live.